So, so let's talk about the things that you do uh, in, in in my world. And one of the ones that we alluded to at the top is uh, is is Spotify, uh, and I, I think it's a fascinating company uh, with a lot of um, interesting directions that they can go in from here. So, what was your process, I guess, just for for people that are interested in public market investings in general, like how? How did you go about building conviction and these, uh, a thesis around uh, Spotify as a as a business? Like, what were the the actual things that you did to gain conviction? And then, what what was the thesis of where you thought they could go? Sure. So, I mean, Spotify, obviously, a business that I was just sort of latently aware of, was aware of it pre IPO as a consumer product, right? Streaming music. Um, and was aware of it, obviously, when it direct listed and, and looked at it a handful of times at a light level over time and basically kept coming away saying like, gosh, I kind of like the business, but it's just a hard price, right? And ultimately, and we'll, we'll get to it in a second, you, for me to make an investment, I need to have a view on what I think the end state, like bounds around what the end state could look like. And it's hard to be really aggressive with Spotify's end state, which is what we'll talk about. And I think the market was implying that this is going to be one of the great business franchises. It's obviously a multi-billion dollar business. It's, it's a great company, but it's no Google. Um, and and so now, you, you, the price was reflecting that. The in price your was the price demanded that the company perform in a way that I would never be comfortable betting on. Yeah. Right. That ultimately its margin structure in 2030 or whatever is much higher than I think it's easy to justify. Um, and even today, it's a medium sized position for me because the hard thing is, what is that margin structure going to be? And Spotify has a dominant is the leading, you know, business model for streaming music, streaming audio. However, and so you would think, okay, they've got this massive scale advantage. Scale is automatically going to give them, you know, the ability to take margin over time, et cetera. But realistically, they, they're one of, call it four or five important music distributors. And there's only four music suppliers. And that's what really makes the business model challenging, right? There's three big music labels, Warner, Universal, and Sony. And then there's this kind of like co-op um, called Merlin. And those four run an oligopoly and they own the content, right? So Spotify has to license the content from them and they're never going to have an advantage over those four players because if Spotify doesn't have, you know, um, universal music on its service, it does not have a service. Yeah. And that's so, what's interesting. And by the way, before Spotify went public, they had to actually renegotiate. Uh, I mean, there's clearly the, the, these labels basically act effectively as the mob and they get to say to Spotify how much margin Spotify is totally. going to have. And so every every time these negotiations come up, it ends up being some very tense negotiation, or it has been historically, we can talk about the optimistic case of why it might not be going forward, but it's some tense negotiation of, hey, we'll give you this amount of, uh, we'll give you this amount of profit that you're going to be able to generate here. And it's negotiated not as a fixed upfront payment, it's negotiated as a percentage of Spotify's sca sales. That's so a it's, share. it scales yeah. linearly, right? So it's actually like gross margin is fixed in this case. Uh, and so Margin. it leads to this very interesting dynamic. And then the, the implicit thing that I think people understand when, when you say it out loud is that you need the back catalog to exist at all as a, as a, uh, as a publisher or as a uh, aggregator of music. And so if, if you don't have the Beatles, I think Garth Brooks maybe is one of the few that's still holding out, but for a long time, there were a bunch more. And if you were missing Sony's back catalog or Universal's back catalog, there was a huge hole in in what you had. And therefore, that was almost like not having a service at all, right? If you didn't have the Beatles and Kanye West and, you know, Jay-Z was on title for a while, then people wouldn't use your service, right? Which is different than Netflix or HBO Max or whatever, where you're not, I, I just finished watching The Wire again for the second time and I'm watching Sopranos again for the second time, but I'm not watching that 
25 times, right? I've listened to My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy by Kanye 25 times, right? Or whatever it is, 125 yes. times. And so that is, it's just a very different dynamic between the, the two but, services, both because of the oligopoly, uh, oligopoly nature of it, as well as, you know, the, the usage and behavior of their end consumers. Yeah. And I would add it's, it's, it would be one thing for Spotify to not have the Beatles as long as Apple Music doesn't have the Beatles and YouTube Music doesn't have the Beatles. It's a whole nother thing if it's only Spotify that doesn't have the Beatles, right? Because in the end, they're trying to sell a commodity product, which is access to all the music in the world. That's very different than Netflix. Netflix is trying to sell unique IP. You can only get the con you can only get Stranger Things on Netflix. You can only get, you know, certain licensed content on Netflix. And so because one is reselling a commodity product and one is trying to create and license unique content, that makes them like really different business models. Even though in our head, we think of them as, oh, they're both streaming services. The fundamental way they have to compete is totally different. And so let's play reselling. This out. Let's play this out for a second, because I would have thought initially when they both went public, I sort of, uh, and I don't know to what extent Ben Thompson, I just read his stuff and it kind sure. of lines my thinking. Uh, it, you know, I'm just like, oh yeah, that's obviously the right take. But I, I originally sort of agreed with Ben that having uh, having differentiated content uh, was was better, right? That Netflix had a better business because they had differentiated content versus all the other services that were out there. And Spotify was worse because they had commoditized uh, content on the back end. Now, I think we would both agree that the uh, the linear scaling of COGS is worse, right? But like, you know, just the supply element of it between the two, I think I would have, I definitely defaulted to Netflix having the better of the two. Right. So ask yourself, like, is Walmart worse than like Hermes, right? It's like, well, one has really unique content, like high-end fashion, and the other sells the same thing every store in the U.S. sells. They just do it at scale, and that and it means they have to operate with a really low-cost operating structure in order for them to generate margin over time, right? Because it's not like Spotify doesn't have any margin. Their gross margins are mid-20s, and they would say like their music gross margin, because they're doing other things, podcasts and whatnot that are blending it down. They have advertising business models and they're doing other things. Their music gross margin is 28 and they think it could be whatever, call it 30 to 35 over time. So they have some pathway to gross margin expansion, but the real pathway to fundamental bottom line margin is through running a really lean business, right? So they need revenue to grow, gross margin to grow faster than that, and then free cash flow margin to grow the fastest because they're efficient with OPEX. And so that becomes your question is, does Spotify believe that, right? Like, does Daniel Eck want to run a lean, efficient business? And of course, like, it's a commodity content product, but they're trying to bundle it and package it and customize it in ways that are unique, right? Your playlists, knowing your tastes, being able to integrate podcasts into it, which could have a fundamentally different gross margin profile over time, whatever. Um, but yeah, I, I think you have to look at it and say, all right, my decision in owning Spotify is that the commodity content is a feature, not a bug. And we need to operate into that as a strength. Yeah, I think that's kind of proven out in that, like, ultimately, it, it, it controlled the playing field by which you're competing, right? Totally. And Spotify has been able to out-execute on the pure UI and ML and just the overall experience on the front end where the back end's all the same. It doesn't matter if it's Amazon or Apple or whatever. So they were able to focus their attention on the front end, which which seems to have, just on the music side, and let's talk about the podcast side in a second, but seems to have given them leverage now over some of the music labels in the sense that, I don't know if this is explicit or implicit, but I'll tell you, those those uh, playlists that they've come up with, whatever, Rap Caviar or yep. Beats, whatever, like those they are- They make artists. Those are definitely having impact on the discovery side because yes. when when content is commoditized, 
dis or when when it's the same across platforms, discovery becomes much more important, right? And yeah. now that Spotify has these great ML driven uh, playlists and all of that, they're actually increasingly getting leverage over the labels, right? Which is just this thing that I never really saw happening, but it, it's it's impressive to see how well they've executed on that. Yeah, I mean, so go back to the Walmart discussion, right? So the end cap like the very, the closest part to you when you're about to go down an aisle, that's the most valuable place for a consumer products company to place their product. And that's like the playlist. If you can get on Rap Caviar, you're on the end cap on like a retail, yep. you know, strategy. Now, the other thing to your point is, I, I wouldn't say Spotify has leverage over the labels, but they've become highly useful to the labels. And I would say at this point, the labels really can't walk away from Spotify either. They're going to walk away from 20% of their revenue base if they do that. And a huge amount for their most popular artists, like who are the most streamed artists as well, right? And so I would say it's become a little more balanced. I don't think Spotify is ever going to get the better of them, but they know Spotify is a great channel for the labels and therefore their artists to reach the end user. So like, uh, you know, Justin Bieber coming to your town, Spotify can make sure you're aware of that, sell you tickets, sell you the t-shirt, you know, get you into their, um, you know, Justin Bieber fan club, whatever it is. And so that, that has become an extra piece of margin where even though they might not get a better deal on music from Universal, Universal is kind of able to pay them a little bit more through the back door a little bit. And, uh, you know, they, they pick up margin there. And so, yeah, that quote marketplace model has become very valuable, um, to Spotify. And that's a really high margin business. Cause it really is more like, um, you know, if you look at Amazon, Amazon has the one P business where that's a low margin, high capital intensity. They have the three P business where someone else is selling the products on Amazon marketplace. That's more like what the Spotify marketplace is. That's a really high, we just have a take rate. We, you know, we don't have to have inventory or anything. 